1935, the Lions win the NFL championship. The Detroit Tigers take the World Series. The Red Wings bring home Lord Stanley's Cup. Joe Lewis begins his rise to world domination. This transforms the Motor City into Detroit, City of Champions. All right, there we go. Anchors away. It is Detroit City of Champions, the podcast. I'm Jamie Flanagan. Charles Avison. And uh, diving deep into 1935, the year and everything uh, around today, it. Today it's about to get super deep. Yeah. Super deep. And yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 literally super deep. And uh, we've, we've studied a whole bunch of stuff throughout the podcast, and we are waist deep. We are neck deep into Gar Wood. Yes. Uh, and just the I would say waist thunder deep. from down I would under. I say waist deep. We got another, we got another <laughs> half, a, half of a body to go to really wrap this yeah, one up. Yeah. But this is so. And that's the thing. Um, I was looking back and uh, you had asked me to because we people can follow us. Uh, oh, and, and if you're listening, hey, that's a good time to mention it. Thanks for listening. And don't forget to like, subscribe, collect, uh, leave a comment. It's very, very cool. Tell a friend that is very, very cool. That's the best thing in the world. Yeah, Share yeah. with somebody. Yeah. But it's on Facebook and it's on YouTube. Uh, people can watch wherever. And then the audio podcast on, you know, nearly every potty pod app available you can find it so wherever you're listening thank you so much uh and then on the youtube i was making playlists and and i was looking at uh how many episodes that because we really took our time with joe lewis and uh that was kind of you look neat. back at the tigers we have like four, five, four five, five, episodes. five total episodes for two years of tigers i know we're gonna revisit those subjects because uh, we were just getting started we, we were, were just, just we're getting figuring started. out and that's the thing it's like that's uh they talk about podcasts and they say uh, uh about 80 percent of podcasts never make it past the seventh episode we're on episode 57 57 i'm pretty happy about i am too i I can't wait to hit 100 i'm really looking forward to to hitting 100 about Um, one season in detroit sports history yeah about one season. that's what's so crazy yeah what others just to show you how great this season was right right what other season in the history of of american sport single season single any name one single year in the history of american sport that you could even be where we're at with 57 episodes right right you for 57 episodes for one single season like you there's you'd have to be talking about the 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 color of somebody's socks by this point (laughs) you know and we're as you're about to hear in this show well we did talk about the color of socks in uh the red wings well, we, well, we, that's we, germane to the thing. Yeah, no, I'm just, but, the, right. but what I'm saying though, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is, is socks that are a thing. This is that we, the, as we're going to see today, <laughs> that we're going to be full throttle. Yeah, full throttle. This is going to be one of the most fascinating things that, as a listener of this show, it, this is going to be one of the most amazing stories you have ever heard. I, I okay? love because you love Garwood. You, you said I love it. It's my favorite story. The entire the favorite. city. Of, there's 33 <laughs> championships in 1935, and, and this is my favorite of them all. And then you said, then you said, as we were getting not ready my favorite. Today, it's my favorite story. Right, right. And you yeah. said that uh, the aspects of today's episode, number 57 here. Is uh, some of your favorite parts of uh, the Garwood story? Absolutely, this is one of my favorites. This is one of my favorite components of it, and we've been laying a lot of groundwork for this. We've been telling a lot of the backstory, yeah. And it's all, and a lot of it's going to really kind of you know vector t- together in this in this story I'm about to tell here. But I'm going to say it again, real quick. I mean, we've made, been making claims since the beginning of this. Sure. It's the greatest season ever. Right. Joe Lewis had the greatest individual season in American sport history, despite him not even being listed amongst the top 100 on any sure. rankings. We make a ton of different claims in this on this show, and I'm saying right now, if this is not what I'm about to present today, if this is not one of the greatest stories or one of the most interesting <laughs> things you've yeah. ever heard on any podcast yeah. regarding sports, then I'll say right now, don't even listen anymore because I'm a liar. I'm a liar. <laughs> if this is not one of the coolest and most right. fascinating I'm stories stoked. in all of, not just like that you've ever heard, but in all of Detroit sports history, this story that you're about to hear today. Should be one of the most should be on like sort of a uh, 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 just like a Mount Everest or not Mount Everest, but a uh, uh you know, Mount Rushmore, the, Mount, thank you, Mount Rushmore of Detroit sports stories. Mm-hmm. And this is just one of the stories we're going to be doing, and we're going to be doing episode number 58, and we're going to be telling another great story. Uh, when we last left Gar. Yeah. He was having a trouble getting people to race. He was racing yeah. trains racing and he was trains. Uh, starting he's his own in, circuit. He's racing in a tuxedo and, to kind of get everybody uh, just, interested because uh, he's racing in a tuxedo. Because so, people said it wasn't gentlemanly, so we want to race in a tuxedo. Yeah. But he's but he was doing these little stunts because he was just he was he was already he was at the top of the game. 
and there was nobody in the world that wanted to challenge him. And, but now things are picking up. So he's starting to, there's, there's some competition starting to come back. Well, yeah, Fran, yes, the French uh, challenged the French him. Challenged. The French challenged him. It in didn't go well for the French no, a couple go, of times. No, they couldn't even, the first one, the boat caught on fire before they got to Detroit. <laughs> and then in 1926, when they challenged him for the Harmsworth, they got the boat in the river, but then they couldn't get it started. Yeah. And then Garwood's men even went to try to help them get it started, just like it have a started. race. Couldn't get it started. And they couldn't get it started. So Garwood's three boats raced against each other in the and Gar who, the who won? who won that one again? The, yeah, take a guess. Gar Gar Garwood won that. <laughs> Garwood beat his brother and somebody else to, right on, to right uh, you know in the Miss America five beat out the Miss America three and yeah. Miss America four. So right, Garwood's right. three boats raced each other. And the and Garwood, of course, you know, one of, of the three boats, Garwood piloted boat one. And so. that brings uh <laughs> and that brings us over to where we're headed today. Yes, which is so nineteen twenty seven again, so again, twenty five and twenty six, there was a theoretical yeah. you know, twenty five there was no race. 1926, there was a race against the French, but the French didn't start the boat. 1927, there's no race, but now we're starting now we're in nineteen twenty eight and the in from here on out. It's going to be, like I say, year after year after year is going to be some of the most incredible stories you've ever heard with regard to anything. I mean, I never I never got into the city champions going like, oh, I'm interested in speedboat racing. I had no interest in speedboat yeah. racing. I had no I had no interest in speedboat racing until I started hearing about this stuff. Well, and then part of that was your research. You came across this book called The Speedboat Kings. Exactly. The Speedboat Kings, like it's one of the greatest and, history books of all time. And the, the writing in it is just, it's really rich. Um, it I takes love, you into the, the boat. Man. Yeah. It's amazing. Jay Lee and Barrett's it was so first amazing. person because yeah. he, he was there. He was literally yeah, there. For those of us these... that might be going for the first that first time, this is the Speedboat Kings yeah, book. I got it up there. Yeah. Oh, you got, the, oh, you got that up on the screen. Good. Yeah. So I got my copy right here. It's one of, I don't know how many copies, but not very many because they, like I say, we, I got it for, I got it for, uh, I think a hundred bucks um, eight years ago. And the last listing I saw it on Amazon was for 800. So good. So like, you know, you know, our, you know, Chris was, Chris was typing in saying that he's, he thinks he might've found a library copy. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. That. Like you could find yourself, a, you find yourself a copy in any yeah. bookshelf, look for speedboat Kings because, uh, Besides just the value of the, I wouldn't even sell my copy. I'm no. not even, I don't even care. It's not even worth, I don't want to sell for 800 because then I have to buy it back. What well, I'm not going to, you know, right, <laughs> so, right. It's 19, I like mine. 1927. Yeah, uh, nineteen. Uh, no, we're original. at we're at 1927. Yeah, so we're now we're at, well 19. We're rounding into 1928. Okay. And so in 1928, so Garwood gets a gets a challenge this time from England. So going forward, and this for the Harmsworth. This challenge is for the, for the Harmsworth. Harmsworth. Yes, this okay. is the only trophy that this is the uh, this is the only trophy that matters for Garwood sure. at this point. It's sure. the Harmsworth. It's the international world championship. All the boats, all the materials for the boats have to be made in America. The race because, the boat has to be made from where they originate. So English yes. boats have to have English all engines English and English engines, woods, all English woods, all right, English right. carburetors, all English everything. Right, and that's right. a difficult so thing the French to find. Need that? Need yes. that had to be all yes. French. Yes. When he was racing the French, it had all, all to be exactly. French. Yeah. And so it's and so that's the idea is that each boat has to be built into you know out of and the we parts just from we just country. got out of World War One. Yes. And so there's all this army surplus and there are all these. So we had, we had, he had quite the, the surplus to work with. Well, he was using them. That was the, a couple episodes. The big back. thing that is that the American airplanes were using, you know, originally he, he used the Curtis engines, which were, you know, decommissioned. They, the U S uh, air force never used the Curtis. Rejected engines. them. They didn't use them. So he so wasn't. That's why he was able to get his hands on some. And yeah. that's what, that was his big thing was turning aircraft engines into in using it for boats, right. it, which is and because they were lighter, more powerful than car engines. That's what really, Really started giving him the advantage and so after world war one he brought in all these surplus engines from all over these from all these different airplanes and of course the liberty packard engine yeah. was like the best one and so he's got packard which is detroit of course so he's got a liberty packard detroit engine in his boats and so that's what he's been, so that's what yeah. he's been modifying and you know the whole thing is really to reduce the weight you know, because mm -hmm. you know, to, to get that energy out of those engines and to you know, with as little weight as possible. So, this harm's worth, uh, you, you're challenging from your country, your boat has to originate from your country. All, and every England piece. here yes. in 28, England is uh, saying, put them up, put them up. Yeah, and so English, England challenges, England wants the title back. So, is know? it like just the, 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 the English team and then Gar's team? Well, in this case. And, and it just depends. And, yeah. and then, or do other teams from other countries jump in too at that there's, point? Yeah, there are various ones, but usually there's an, there's a main challenger. Right. And then a lot of times there'll be some people that jump in that see what, you know, just, hey, we might as well put a boat in the river and see what happens. You know, maybe okay. the other boats break down. Um, so you'll find that that, that kind of happens, but usually there's like a centerpiece of the race and right. the person that challenged versus the previous winner. And this and time a, it's England. 
this time it's England. And, and in, in this case, of course, the, the rules of the of the race of the boat world at this time mm-hmm. are that w- if you well, if you win, <laughs> if, you, if you win the race, if you win the race, whatever, whether it's a gold cup or whether it's the Harmsworth, the international, if you win the race the previous year, the opponent has to face you on your river, of course. Yeah. And so and so England has to come to Detroit and so and race on the Detroit River. And so in this, in this, and it's not just necessarily the government of England. In this case, in, uh, you have um, a, a lady, and this is, uh, I was actually going to name the title this because she's a, she's a fascinating character, but we, but we, we ended up naming it something different. Uh, the ladies, the, the lady who, cha- it was a lady who challenged Garwood, mm-hmm. which is reminiscent of another lady that was a, a bold The very first winner earlier of on, the yeah. very first time. Yeah, Dorothy so. Levitt, I believe her name was. Yep. Uh, and so, um, in this, in this lady, her name is Miss Marion Barbara Carstairs. Okay. And so she is, um. So her, so her mother was the second child to one of the founders of Standard Oil. Okay, so Standard, right. Standard Oil is the one of the probably the one one of if not the biggest company ever. How could they ever? ever fu- how could they ever fund it? Ever made? Yeah. So so, <laughs> so, so, so she. So yeah. So she is basically from the from her earliest age. And he expect there was a couple things she did. Like she she ended up getting uh, she ended up getting married just so she could get this uh, dowry from her mom, and then they divorced just so she could get the money. Oh my god! Um, so she could just have access. I mean, but she is fabulously wealthy, and she can. Ba- and then when and then when her grandmother died, who was married to the founder of standard, one of the founders of standard oil, then she even got even richer. So she is, she's got as much money as, so there's no financial advantage between her and Garwood. She's got as much money as she wants to spend. And so, but she was this, we have a picture of her to put up on the, you have it up on the screen. Yeah. Uh, She's a really, if you ever, anyone has a chance to look her up, it's really an interesting read. Her name is again, Miss Marion Barbara Carstairs. Just a, there's no way we can get into her today. It'd take, it'd basically be an entire show, but she's a fascinating uh, person. um, Really interesting person. She drove, just a good little brief stops. She drove ambulances during world war one. Oh, wow. Um, At this point, she's really just totally into speedboat racing. She's what, she's got a string of victories. In the French Riviera, she won the 1926 Duke of York Trophy, which is sort of like England's equivalent of the of the Gold Cup. Uh, her nickname was Joe instead of you know full the full handle of Miss Mary and Barbara Carstairs. They called her Joe. Okay, and she was also known at this moment as the fastest woman on water. Uh, she, and so to prepare for this race, she hired S. E. Saunders, who had built the Maple Leaf Four, which had won the 1912 Harmsworth, which was the last Harmsworth that the English won. Okay. And so, uh, and so I think it was the Maple Leaf Five or Six, which is what Gar Wood beat in 1920 to, to take the, the trophy back and bring it back to, to you know, with him to Detroit. So, so she hired this original guy. And so there was reasons to believe that she was going, that she had a very good chance to win this race, not just okay. because of this developer, right, right. but or because of this guy, but because... Uh, of a new engine design for a new British engine design called a Napier Lions engine. And, and so, so to kind of remind everybody, we talked about the Liberty engine um, and now, you know, briefly at the beginning of this episode, but the Liberty engine was right around 500 horsepower. Okay. Okay. And then Garwood had two of them in his boats. So he had it. So in essence, a, a thousand power, a thousand horsepower in his boats with these two <laughs> liberties. So this Napier Lions engine was 875. So the idea is, is that one of these engines is nearly equal to two liberties. And if she's able to put two of them in a boat, that gives her a massive advantage, wow, okay. a massive advantage over, um, you know, over, over Gar Wood uh, for, for this race. Well, you got to keep it afloat and you uh, can't blow up. Well, that's those the key. Two, yeah. Those are two yes. very important things. Exactly. So, but at the very least, the fact that she's got this potential, you know, this Napier Lions engine, this sure. is a ma- you know, this represents a major threat. Whereas the French, you know, Garwood's building all, you know, Miss America four or five, you know, three, four and five, yeah. uh, you know, just to get ready for this race, which, you know, even the, even the, you know, Jay Lee Baird even says Garwood didn't even think the French had it in them. Sure. But this race, he believed that they did. Okay. He, he was, and so he made some serious moves. So, uh, so, so getting ready for this race, he, the Miss America six is born. Okay. Okay. And so this Miss America six is unlike anything that he has ever done yet. So the, in what, so the, uh, because, because at this exact same moment, there's a Packard engineer and his name is LM Woodson, who had worked for months with the United, with the U S Navy Bureau of Aeronautics to oh. develop a reduced weight, 770 horsepower airplane engine that could be that could be tweaked to a thousand horsepower hey. per engine. <laughs> so, so she's got these Napier lines, 875, this, you know, this 770 horsepower airplane engine 
could be tweaked to a thousand horsepower, right? All so right. he could, he's potentially got two one thousand <laughs> over right. the eight seventy five. So okay, so at great expense, Garwood b- uh, bought two of these. In, I mean, these are like in beta testing. These are not, you know, they're not. You know, the U.S. Air Force is not like mass producing these. These are these are like prototypes, okay. And so at great expense, Garwood buys two of these engines and installs them into the newly built Miss America Six. Okay. So the Miss America Six is built with these two new Packard, uh, you know, super weight, 1000 horsepower engines again. So the previous boat had two 500 horsepowers. This new Miss America six has got two 1000 horsepower. That's quite the leap. It's a mass. It's double. We're not the going speed. to seven fifty. We're just no. jumping right to it. We're thousand. going, we're doubling the speed. And again, he's already been pushing 80. He's already right, been right. pushing. He's already right. broke the record with he's right now. Currently he holds a world record for speed on water at 80 miles an okay. hour. Okay. And so now he's got a he's got double the the horsepower, right? And now he's got a race in front now of him. Now he so now he's got a race. Okay, so so I'm going to read you the article. Okay, so this is shortly after Garwood installs these engines into the Miss America Six, and this is 15 days prior Criminy. to Carstairs' arrival. Okay, so fifth this is a little over two. A lot weeks. of time, a lot of time for testing. A lot of leaving a ton of time for testing. <laughs> so I'm going to read you the article of the of the test. Of Race day is not a test. Ten, okay, <laughs> and this is where I live up to my boast about one of the greatest like video right. things. So this is the beginning of this. Okay, all right. So uh, so. Um, so this, again, this comes from Speedboat Kings. Uh, so Garwood and Orlin Johnson, his mechanic, took it out on the river for its first trial, meaning the Miss America Six. It gave them the fastest ride they had ever had in their lives. When Johnson pulled the throttle, the whole quivering thing leapt into life, leaped into life. They were going so fast that their eyeballs felt flattened out of shape by the force of the wind. Johnson said that telegraph posts on shore looked something like, like the teeth in a fine comb. Wood feared to give Johnson the signal for open throttle. He wasn't sure what would happen because he felt the bow was digging in. They strung the boat up in her cradle for the first time in their lives. They were they were wondering what was going to happen when the throttle was all the way was out all the way. After a night's rest, they felt a little more daring. They were out there in the boat well again, getting ready. They didn't care. The Saint Lu- the Saint Clair River was as smooth as glass. While Wood was fastening his two teddy bears more securely to the engines, he turned to Johnson, said. A beautiful day to give her the gun, Orlin. What do you say? Well, Johnson replied nervously as he scanned the river. I can hang on to the thr- I, I can hang on to the throttle. It's okay with me if you can hang on to the wheel. They got ready. Goggles, face grease, ear batting, life belts, and all. They jumped into the cockpit, pressed the ignition button, and cut a swift course down the river. They went easy at first, feeling the tremendous power. Then Wood swung the boat around and they headed upstream. He waited until the course ahead was straight. No bends in the river. Then he nudged Johnson. That meant open throttle. Johnson didn't didn't hesitate. He pulled the throttle. Bedlam broke loose in that tiny craft. The shod hoofbeats of 2,000 steeds. Wood felt like his flesh quivering like that was being ripped from his bones. The whole thundering herd was riding hard and fast through his head. He glanced at Johnson just for a fleeting second. Johnson's face was a strange blur whipped out of shape by the wind. Then, all at once, there was a deafening roar. Sharp, quick, piercing. A tremendous hour followed, or perhaps a moment it was, a blur in time, a kind of twilight sleep. At first, Wood thought he'd pass into another world suddenly, but he opened his eyes and realized he was underwater. He looked up toward the surface, and sticks, tanks, and a thousand broken parts of the boat were spinning perilously near his head in the water above him. He felt comfortable in the well-padded seat of the boat, holding desperately to the steering steering gear. His instinct told him to continue in his present condition rather than get mixed up in the chaos above him. But in a few seconds, he found himself changing his mind swiftly. He was getting into deeper, colder water, and the pressure was getting terrific. He was certain now for the first time that he was actually alive because he was becoming aware of the possibility of being pinioned under what was left of his boat if he continued to sit there comfortably doing nothing. He knew now that something horrible had taken place, and in the desire of self-preservation, he decided to let go and start paddling for the surface. Besides, he wanted to breathe, and there was no available air where he was. How far up the air was he, he didn't know, but there was no point in hanging on, so his hands left the wheel. A very faint feeling of joy. He could move them. He could move his hands. He was going up, always up now. In a moment, he thought he'd reached the surface, but it seemed to never to come. Some air. He could feel that it could go through him like a knife. Finally, the surface. Wood said afterward it was the longest trip he had ever had in his life. 
that trip to the surface. In the surface, covered with blood, floating gas tanks, his new boat in a million slivers. Then he thought of Johnson. He couldn't see him. The sight of that blood on the water made him feel faint. He snatched at one of the floating gas tanks and hung on. He looked around for Johnson again. Johnson's head bobbed up through the pool of blood. His throat was cut almost from ear to ear, his main jugular vein exposed. Wood thought then that Johnson was dead. My God, he muttered, Johnson is dead. But Johnson wasn't dead. Jay Smith, who had been watching the trial from his boat, picked Johnson up and took him to the dock. Wood was brought to shore in another boat. Johnson was unconscious for more than an hour. The first thing that came from his lips was, guess we'll have to build another boat. <laughs> the title of the episode. <laughs> I, I guess we'll have to build another boat. That is the most, is that, tell me that it's not incredible. Oh, that they're, is, they're, they're, the, 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 the hoof beats of 2,000 steeds. That's, that's, <laughs> right? uh, that's just grit. I know, too, man. Just... They're like, the, for the moment, for that one moment, they feel the hoof beats of 2,000. They're going faster <sighs> on water than any human being has ever gone. And then the boat, and then the, the most amazing thing is, is that is that wood they describe wood the, the description of wood mm. under the water and, the, and Jay Lee Barrett knows wood intimately mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. he literally could go to wood and I mean he he's he's part of the story he could yeah. talk to wood anytime he wants that wood is under the water and he's still steering the boat yeah as though he's like driving it yeah. he has, he's unaware all right crazy man he's unaware that the he's unaware that the boat you got a seat in the wheel that's all you got left yeah he's just still steering the <laughs> boat like he's driving he it, i mean he actually walks through the thought process right, right. of the stunning of like one second he's going he's a king of the world and the next second he's just trying to scramble for air sure wow so yeah so so this is so this so miss america six explodes on the detroit river Crap. So the, so they're in the 15 days before the race. Okay. So that's where we're at. So this is the story, right? So um that so, brings us to Miss America Sep. Well, <laughs> spoiler alert. Yeah, yeah. So uh. so before the explosion, Orlin Johnson noted that the tachometer uh uh gauge read 2400 which equates to 98 miles per hour. Oh. They were up to 98 miles an hour oh, before man. that thing exploded. He noticed on the tachometer that it, so he tells, you know, Gar, you know, Gorland's in the Dude, hospital. we're at 98. We were at 98, 98. man. <laughs> Gar, Gar, they're 98. Both, they're both alive. They're both alive. You know, what the hell? Anything you can walk away from, you know, yeah. it, it just kind of makes you stronger, I guess. So, so here's the situation, okay? Mm -hmm. So both men had survived. But they're you know pretty beat up. You know they took, well, they had various injuries, of course. So you know, no, Ronald Johnson's throat got slit. His so it's not it's, it's not slit. quite uh, it's not quite the uh, it's not quite the uh, tuxedo no cruise no, anymore. No, no, they're it's not a, driving around. It's a slightly different cruise this time around. A fancy lady in a white dress is <laughs> not going to have any oil or grease stains. These different. Dudes are, these dudes just got a drove in a basically an explosion man. it was a it's, different ride today yeah orlin got his throat slit man his, they even said his jugular vein was slashed dude so <laughs> yeah so these so the boats exploded so the situation is the, the driver you know or, you know orlin and garav is have survived mm -hmm. by a miracle um but they have no boat they have no engines the engines are at the bottom of the saint Clair river because of the explosion <laughs> yeah yeah and the uh and there's only third now there's you know by the time they're actually recuperate after a couple of days in the hospital they've only got 13 days until the race and so what follows from this and this is where i this is where i live up to um the you know the uh what i said at the beginning of the show that if this is not one of the greatest things you've ever heard with regards to detroit sports history yeah then don't watch anymore because I'm a liar, okay. right? But I'm not a liar. And what I'm about to show you is what follows next is one of the most amazing stories to ever happen in Detroit sports history. All right. Okay. Should we leave off for the next show or should we talk about it now? <laughs> okay, leave so I, we'll talk about it now. <laughs> I, I don't, I, 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 you can leave me hanging. No, I'm not, no, I want to talk about it. All right. All right. I couldn't leave my live with myself. I think our our viewers would be furious. All right. to tear. So this is. So uh, I want to live up to my. We'll I told save you, the if comic. I said, we'll save the by, comic. Book and I know because episode. I said if by the end of this show you haven't heard of this is the greatest okay. thing story. I, and I want to live up to that. I the comic said, books. I was joking. Next, I was joking. I wouldn't story. leave off with that. I wouldn't right. do that to people. And I wouldn't leave off with that either because I haven't. I know I haven't convinced you that this is the greatest story. I've laid the groundwork. I'm on the edge. I've laid the groundwork, I'm, but now we're going to hear the next the next component. Okay. I'm all hyped up on my seat here. All right. Come on. Excellent. So. Um, all right, so uh, where are we at? so pay so this uh, once again this is 
uh, this is um, from Jay Lee Barrett's uh, Speedball Kings, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, all right. So, so here we go. Miss Carstairs was already in Detroit, forty miles down the river with a, with her Estelle too. That's the name of her both, the Estelle too. The race was just thirteen days away. Could Wood get ready? The chances were a thousand to one that he couldn't. The Packard engines were somewhere at the bottom of the St. Clair River in 60 feet of water. But where? Wood didn't know exactly, but they had to find those engines. They were the only two, they were the only ones like them in the world. It had taken Packard engineers six months to build them. If they found the engines, what then? MJ Steele, Packard engineer, believed they might be cracked. Those engines hit the hit the those engines hit the cold water at white heat, he said. We don't know what they'll be like if we if we find them. It looked like the Harmsler Trophy would at last go back to England. Half the town of Algonac, the Coast Guard, the Boy Scouts, fishermen, everyone was scouring the river looking for those engines. But Wood didn't wait until the engines were found, and neither did Packard. Wood, being confined to bed for a day, called his men to Algonac to his Algonac home. Napoleon Lycee, Vance Smith, Lawrence Smith, James McCarthy, and John Brewer. And together they laid out plans for a new and stronger boat. A direct, tele- a direct telephone line was installed in Johnson's room at the hospital in Detroit so he could talk directly to the men. Meanwhile, Packard engineers had a truck standing by at Algonac with the governor taken off, ready to rush the engines to, the de- in- to their Detroit plant, tear them down, clean them, and build them up again. A motorcycle police escort was ready to guide the truck on its way. Steele and G.H. Brody, Packard engineers, set up two lines of operation inside the Packard plant, one to tear down the engines, another to build them up. They had everything ready. Bell divers were sent to the bottom of the St. Clair River. When they started out to search for the engines, Mrs. Wood called to them, be sure to find the teddy bears. The teddy bears had been wired to the engines. Wood himself jumped into the cockpit of his amphibian plane and soared high over the river, trying to spot the black blot of the engines at the bottom. But they couldn't be seen. Then suddenly, Wood remembered something. He had previously learned that an Algonac woman standing on the corner of her cottage on the river saw the boat go to pieces. Wood found the woman and from the exact spot where she had been standing, calculated the possible location. Vance Smith, who frequently drives Wood speedboats, went went out to do the sounding. After four days and nights of constant searching, the engines were found in 60 feet of water, buried in six feet of black muck. The bell diver came up first with Mrs. Wood's teddy bears. Oh. When the engines were brought to the surface, part of the hull was still fastened to them. The tough mahogany wood had ripped off about four inches from where Johnson had been sitting. By only four inches, Johnson had been escaped being split in two. The impact of the water had driven the rudder straight to the bottom of the boat. The engines were rushed to Detroit. Every part of them was torn down, cleaned out, and put back together again. Nothing had been damaged. Meanwhile, the hull builders were working in a mad race with time, driven ahead only by their unquenchable spirit. In exactly 13 days after the Miss America 6 had cracked up, a new boat was built, Miss America 7. Johnson hobbled out of the hospital and supervised the work of setting the engines into the hull. The new boat went into the 1928 race for the British International Trophy without ever having a trial run. The varnish on her was still wet. Johnson was yet so badly crippled that he had to be lifted into the cockpit. He pressed the starting button, and again, a new Miss America was on its way, and Wood and Johnson were again riding with death. That is, dude, that's like that, what? This is a whole community That's coming insane. together. This is a whole community coming together to get these boats built for the race. They're not going to let this. They're not going to let this. They 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 took them to the very last second. The the lacquer wasn't even was still wet when they took it out in the water. They never had a test run. Orlin Johnson. The greatest thing is Orlin Johnson being. You know they're like, why Orlin Johnson? Why can't somebody else run the mechanic? You know they're like, no, we need Orlin. You know, we That's, need Orlin Johnson again. You know, it's, Orlin. it's, Orlin's getting in there going, oh, easy. <laughs> easy. I got a bandage around his uh, neck yeah. from a split jugular. You got you, know? a, you got the bears. You got the bears back recovered. You got, you got the engines. You got Orlin. You got Gary. You got little you got Miss America Could you imagine seven. these two guys sitting back next to each other? They got the Miss America 7. And then the in the greatest yeah. moment is the the one of the things he doesn't really mention in in, in this, maybe he mentions in the book. I, I you know, I didn't read the, the a little bit further on. This is out of the, the quote I have in my book. But the, is is the moment that all these people in Detroit 
They knew of what was going on. Right. They knew they they're reading the articles about this. Of that, there's people all down the riverfront looking for these engines and doing whatever they can. Packard set up a special delivery. The police are ready to escort the the engines to Packard. Everybody's mobilized to make this happen. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be one of the two hundred and fifty thousand people that were on the riverfront that day? These people, they were there because they knew the story of the, yeah. that there was a boat race. They most certainly knew about the events that had led up to it. Could you imagine being down there and seeing the Miss America 7 mm. roaring down the river, coming down? I, the, the Nobody had ever seen the Miss America 7 because the 6 had detonated uh, two weeks prior, <laughs> right? They didn't even right? they had to yeah. find the engines. They just, and the boats come, just the sound of it coming down must have just sent an absolute you know, uh, the goosebumps down the spines of everyone there mm -hmm. And the race was almost, the race was inconsequential. Garwood. Wh who just getting that won? boat back in the water. <laughs> yeah. Who do you think won the race? Garwood dominates <laughs> this race. He destroys her. Really? It's not even the race is an afterthought. Oh you know what I mean? Gosh. He completely, he's got two 1000 horsepower. I think she only had one in her boat, the 875. Uh, okay. And he's got two 1000 pound Packards in his boat that had been pulled out of the lake, restored, refit, new hull built, back in the river, and and ready for racing on oh. the day of the race in full. Like the year before, the French couldn't even get their boat started, and in two weeks they rebuild into the, yeah. the most elite boat that the world had seen up to that point. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like this is, it's got every factor of a of the of what a fantastic story has, and the, like I say, it's just it. You know, it's that. You know, what happens if he doesn't do it? Carstairs wins the trophy out, you know, by default. Yeah, she challenged it. He wasn't there. The boat didn't make it through, and the trophy goes back to England. Garwood's really not the guy anymore, and Detroit's no longer the home of speedball racing. Right. So Chris uh, encapsulated that well. Holy crap, that's just amazing. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so. I hope I lived up to what yeah. I to the to the promise I said at the beginning of this, which is that this is you know this should be. This should be one, you know, you know, this, you know, this story is just one component. There's going to be others. There's going to be other. This is just one of the we're going to hear more and more like this going forward. But the whole story of Garwood, the speed, the world of speed road racing at this time, the drama at this time there. Keep in mind, this is 1920. This is 1928. There's nothing going on in Detroit sports world besides right. this. Yep. The Tigers are garbage. They're, the lines don't exist. The Red Wings had just come into the city. They were the Cougars at this point. Right. The Cougars were nothing. They were not even on the. They were they were a speck on the NHL scene, and the Detroiters looked at them as this weird Canadian hockey right, right. high sport, whatever. So as I'm saying, this was Detroit sports in the night in, in 1928. Right, right. This was this was what was going on. This is what was going on in the drama that people were following. Nobody like this story here. Where do you ever hear about this? And today, you, no. know, you don't really follow sports that closely. But I'll tell you, as someone who does, you never hear this. You Anything never hear this about Gar. You, every once in a while, you hear Garwood was a great speedball racer. He yeah. did this and that. No, Garwood was an amazing sports luminary yeah. and who was who authored one of the greatest stories from his life, you know, from just him living his life and yeah. pushing the boundaries. And people like they say Orland Johnson saying, we're going to need another boat. Right? <laughs> so we're going to need another that's, boat. That's, uh, there's no way to describe that but uh, grit. Mm -hmm. Just the determination yes. uh, and grit of these two guys. Of all to, of them, the whole squad, to, the city, the people that are coming out looking for the engine. You know, like the police, the Packard's setting up a special facility that's just ready to go at all times, ready to tear the engines down and rebuild them. Everything is lined up. And they're doing it all from the hospital. They even said in the article there, uh, Orland Johnson, he wasn't even able to get out of the hospital until for like two weeks. I yeah. mean, he was said, do, given all of his orders from the hospital bed. They had a direct phone line set up from the hospital. That's wild. And like, no, can anybody else run the? Can anybody else run the throttle for no. Gar? No. No. The answer is we need Orlin in the. We need Orlin there, and or like I say, they had to. They had to lift him in with a crane or whatever. They to squeeze him into the, into the boat. Jeez. So, anyways, yeah. So, so there's a little postscript to this to this race. The Miss. So the Miss America Seven. Uh, after the race mm -hmm. goes on to, to set the official new world record at 92.838 miles an hour. 92. Getting there. Getting, getting there. there. They're getting there. They Hello, got two, 100. <laughs> they got two 1,000 horsepower liberties. We're about to take it. We're about to ratchet it up just a little oh, bit in the next couple of shows. Out. So that's to say they're getting there. It's, a lot of, it's been a long way. And 
28 years when they were going putting along at 12 miles an hour as a world uh, record for speed on water. Now we're at 92 and just in, in, in 25, you know, 25 years. All right. We are going to continue with Garwood uh, in the next episode, Charles. I just, this you were, I just, I concur. That's, yeah, uh, that's an a, yeah. amazing story. I think, so we, you think we I can't our wait. Listeners? I kind of wish we, this was the episode that we had done in the Packard plant. We got we got a lot more man. And sitting in front of Miss America Ten, but I may let me nice. Wait till we get to the Miss America Ten. We're setting the stage. We're this is the Miss America Seven because the Miss America Ten is in the pack plant here in Metro Detroit, and uh, we got permission to go and record. Really awesome, dude. That's so So, freaking cool. I can't wait. We we can. I got to go scout and see where we can set up. Oh, dude, uh, I want to be how close we can get. If we can sit in the ten, that'd be like that'd be like one of the greatest things of all time. Uh, I don't know if we can record in it, but why not? Maybe 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 they'll let us. Man. I'll try. We're going to be, re- dude, if we're recording from the Miss America 10, it's well, it's like ever. when we did last year. Uh, dude, we're coming up on Champions Day. Oh, I absolutely. 10. I absolutely. We're sitting do. in the Miss America 10 side by side and we're doing a show without about a, Miss with, America 10 in the Miss America 10. A, without a doubt. It, but last year we uh, we did uh, Champions Day, right? April yeah, April, April 18th. 18th uh, and we recorded live at, uh, at the D- Detroit, Detroit Historical, Historical Museum. Museum. Yeah. And we were talking about the plaque. Um, that was awarded at the Cherry Festival that celebrated all the champions signed by yeah. all the governors and the president. And uh, we were there right in front of it. But we went, we came in and we're like, yeah, hey, we're here to, you know, we got permission and we're like, we're going to do the podcast. And they're like, yeah, all right, go ahead. And it's like nobody, nobody was watching us. We could have done anything yeah. in the museum. Yeah. I mean, we could have like jumped in one of the cars or whatever we wanted. They were, I'm like, how are you leaving us unsupervised? Yeah. Do I look like the kind of person who should be left unsupervised? Look, I think you have an honest face. When, so, you know, so maybe they'll leave us unsupervised and we'll jump in the boat. Dude, well, I don't think, what are, they, what are we going to do? What kind of harm are we going to do? We're not going to break <laughs> the boat. We're, we're going there out of reverence for this yes. thing. I mean, we're, this is the, this is like my, on my bucket list for God's yes. sake. So you that'll, know, that'll be cool. Sit in the so. Miss America 10 to broadcast a show. But what I'm saying is this is the story of the Miss America 6 this to 7. 6 and 7. The yeah, Miss America, so. This is the, you know, the birth of the Miss America 7. The Miss America 6 is legendary, too, just yeah. for its fate. Like, what, <laughs> you know, for like, you know, it was for them in there just, you know, pushing the boundaries of speed on water and then to get to the 7. Yeah. But as great as it was with the 7, do ratchet that up to an 11 oh, okay to once we to get this i'm saying the story the evolution of these boats All that right. goes because the seven's good for a second like that thing they're pushing 92 miles an hour yeah. he don't i mean he's about to take this thing out for for a minute but anyways but by the time we get to the miss america 10 like but you saw what he had to do like car stairs was threatening with this new napier yeah. lions engine 875 so we had to take it up to the next level but what's going to the, what the ongoing theme of what people are going to what you're going to hear as we go through episodes 58, 59, 60 and, and so forth to the rest mm-hmm, of Garwood's mm-hmm, story mm-hmm. is that there's going to be the English are going to say, screw that 8, 875. We got a 1200. Uh-oh. Screw that 1200. We got a 1300. Yeah. They're going to be coming in. They're, they're going to be the entire British Admiralty is going to get involved. Their entire British government is going to get involved. Right. Right. They're going to be bringing engines of capacities that are previously unheard of mm. in human understanding and gar's, and gar's like, got to keep it pace bring it on bring man. it on and then it's going to get to the point with the miss america 10 this is a little teaser is that's going to get to the miss america 10 where the british threat is so big yeah. it's so big that he has to go to ridiculous lengths like it's the the nickname of the Miss America Ten is the Madman's Dream. Okay. Okay. This is not like oh they built a boat that was bigger than the last one. No, this is the there is nothing. The Madman. This was dream. there after the Miss America Ten. There was no Miss America Eleven. It All had right. maxed out insanity. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it had maxed out right insanity. On. And once he built the Miss America Ten, it, there's nobody ever challenging him. Right. I mean, I'm saying like this is. That's where we're going with this. This is the Miss America Seven, right. the eight, nine, and ten. Those are stories that were that the listeners are going to have to tune into All for right. episodes fifty-eight. So yeah, so make sure you like and subscribe, and uh, that way you won't miss any of this or the other stories as we unfold them. All it's the Detroit City of Champions, uh, the podcast. We'll see you next time.